shall work the old good evening and well done. But if it still works, it's got that perennial value of making people feel welcome. Uh, my name is Oren Ryan. Uh, on behalf of the Limerick Writers Centre, it's uh, my distinct pleasure and privilege to uh, MC uh, the launch of All About Town by uh, Michael McGrath. I can see him standing He's slightly nervous. It's an awesome, awesome, wonderful book. I spent most of today reading it, and uh, I really can't think of a more suitable uh, book to be launched on Culture Night here in Limerick because it's uh, literally suffused with stories about Limerick and particularly about the culture of Limerick, whether it's the heartbreak of lost love or the pain of the road not taken or the choices made in, difficult choices made in the life of a priest. And this is a very, very readable and uh, written book. You can't put it down, basically. Michael McGrath is a novelist and short story writer. He's also a teacher. His first novel, The Clock Tower, uh, came out in 2017. And uh, tonight, the Limerick Writer Centre has the pleasure of launching All About Town. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce myself, uh, Mr. Dominic Taylor, to say a few words about the LWC, the Limerick Writer Centre. Dominic. the road got dinner. Thanks Oren and uh, thanks for all of you coming uh, here this evening. Someone reading a book is a sign of order in the world. Mary Russell, poet. Tonight we celebrate the launch of a new book. The author, as you know, is Michael McGrath. The publisher is the Limerick Writer Centre. And as publishers of Michael's book, I just want to set out the role of the Limerick Writers' Centre. What we try to do is to bring ideas about books, literature and writing to as wide an audience as possible. And I believe that there is something important going on here tonight, and some would say even radical. Something important and radical on a number of levels, and I think perhaps we should give some thought to what is happening here. This is a publishing and creative event. Today, we live in a world dominated by large commercial publishers with global imprints. In recent years, large media businesses, people who privately own radio, television, cable, magazines, newspapers, websites, have bought up more and more of the many traditional publishing houses. And we have now reached a stage where a small number of large conglomerates are in control of publishing. And this basically means that they're in control of what a sizable number of the population reads. I believe that we should be aware of small and community publishers like the Limerick Writer Center and our other imprint, Revival Press, and the work they do. We should also question how well they are supported by our Arts Council and local authority arts offices. I believe that small independent publishers play an important and vital role in the life of our communities. Small independent publishing houses are run by people who do books because of their passion or belief, and because of a love of writing, books, and literature, certainly not because of the profits they might generate. The book we are launching tonight is the 90th title the Limerick Writer Centre has published since 2008 under its community publishing program. At the Limerick Writer Centre, we share a belief that writing and publishing should be made both accessible and available to all. We try as much as possible to represent diverse voices and advocate for increased writing and publishing access to individuals and groups that have not typically had this access. We promote writing done by ordinary people, people who maybe are not trained writers and may struggle to get their ideas down on paper. We value difference and welcome people who may lack confidence in themselves and their writing ability. We bring together groups of people who value literature, not just for its literary value, but who see its transformative power both for the individual and society. And we believe that stories, 
poems, diaries, memoirs do, as Seamus Heaney suggests, function as bearers of value. We are also importantly dedicated to printing short-run, high-quality produced titles that are accessible for readers. We actively encourage writers and the serious career-minded, the people who write for pleasure, healing, personal growth, insight, or just to inform. And over the years, we've produced a broad range of writing, including poetry, history, memoir, and general prose. Books are still a, a powerful form of dialogue between individuals and communities. The technology of the book is old, but it is still cutting edge. And at the end of the day, as Samuel Beckett rightly stated, words are all we have. We each have something to say that describes ways of living in the world and as such are an indispensable part of the tapestry that goes up to make up, to make up our lives. <clears throat> the Limerick Writer Centre core value has always been that literature is essential. We believe in the love of reading, in the art of writing, and in the power of the literary arts to transform individual lives and communities. And that is why we will continue to work to advance the artistic development of writers and to foster a thriving literary community. I would like to congratulate Mike on the publication of his book and wish him well in his writing career. Mike has made that journey from the imagination to the page, a journey fraught with difficulties, and I know how easily plans can go astray, fizzle out, and lose momentum. The journey from the imagination to the page is rarely an easy one. Often, that special cargo writers carry gets lost overboard in the rough seas of a turbulent crossing. And you may arrive at your destination without your goods. I like to think that this is where the Limerick Writer Centre comes in, providing a strong and steady ship to carry that precious cargo safely to harbour, safely to publication. Thanks, Alec. Hey, how do you follow that? I know something that could. Miles Breen is an actor, director, and playwright, and he's been surrounded by the arts all his life. He introduced to theatre at a young age. He has performed on television, uh, played Claudius, won numerous awards, um, he's involved deeply in charity work. There was just so many amazing things. I, I, I got his biography off, and it's just, it's... Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, an awesome mile read to speak about, all about. Uh, We won one award, not numerous, but thank you very much for uh, Thank you very much, Dominic Orn, and especially the Writer Centre, and especially uh, Michael uh, for inviting me to launch uh, this, this book, All About Town. Um, Michael will be a teacher, of course. I had to do my homework, so I very uh, kindly got a copy of the book from Dominic, and it was not homework at all, and it was an absolute pleasure and joy to read. Uh, and pretty much devoured it in one sitting. So that is a huge trip to Michael, that it's a book you won't want to put down. Um, so uh, congratulations, Michael. And uh, just a few of my own personal impressions, and uh, no spoilers, as I, I told Michael, as they say. Uh, first and foremost, uh, from the very first story, and um, you got me glasses. <laughs> uh, the Glass and the Globe, and it's the first story in the book. Uh, you immediately know you're in the hands of a master storyteller. Um, uh, a script from the first paragraph. And also, more importantly, I suppose, for all of us here, uh, we were in the hands of a master storyteller from Limerick. Uh, the whole book is suffused with, uh, uh, with Limerick, both in terms of its geography, its scenery, its streets, its pubs, its shops, uh, its characters. Uh, they go range from age uh, up and down and also from backgrounds. Uh, but they all have that distinct, uh, which I felt anyway, uh, limerick sense of place, sense, sense of character, sense of humour, uh, sense of, and also of course, um, limerick weather turns up quite a lot in it as well. Not, the weather today turns up as well, occasionally. We also do get the rain, occasionally. But that's the whole thing about the book. It feels very much of this place, 
uh, but also universal. And I think that is the key to uh, great writing, is that it's uh, personal, it's local, but it's also global. And the book definitely is that. And they, they do say, um, if you read Ulysses by James Joyce, hands up here who's read all of Ulysses by James Joyce. Only one, Michael. <laughs> yeah, I go up two, go three, we're all up to. I was not in your room, but that's good. Uh, but they do say, I managed to get through bits of it, but not the whole thing. But they do say, if you read Ulysses, you will be able to walk around Dublin City on that day in that year and find your way around. And you would, you wouldn't need a map, you would find your way around. And definitely with this book, you have the same sense, you have the same sense of, of the city as a character in all the stories as a place that it informs the characters and if you know you can use the book as a map of the story to different places and stuff like that. Uh, but instead of just like you know, naming streets and describing vistas, what I think is lovely about the book for Limerick people is, is that it makes you look at Limerick in a fresh light. Uh, in his descriptions of different places, go, oh I never thought of it as like that. Uh, or kind of statue or there's a, a beautiful turn of phrase and there's one which really uh, tickled me. Uh, Hands up here who's drank at South's pub. Yeah, uh, hands up and you drank in South's pub over the last 30 years. <laughs> right, yes. There was a time a while back when South's pub, well known pub, had changed its decor. Oh, the shock, the horror. Yes, because it had like the old wood and the, and the snug and all the rest. And they did a big re decor, and people who went into it went, oh my god. <laughs> and I ended up in Dublin 4, what's going on? What have you done to Souths? It's not the same. But of course now, the decor is Souths, and it's the Souths we know and love. But at the time we weren't that crazy about it. No. Uh, however, a uh, character in The Glass and uh, The Globe says this. He also noted that the classical decor, glass panels, various brass fittings, could be admired all the more without the regular drinkers leaning against them. And it's just a lovely way of looking at South. Oh, well, I never noticed that lovely bit of brass over there. It, and it just, as I say, it makes you look at South in a completely different way. And there's moments like that throughout all the stories, where you sort of go, oh, I, I know Limerick, I know where that is, but I never thought of it exactly like that. So that, that, that was really uh, tickled me. Uh, the other thing, as I said, no spoilers. Um, as you know, I love, uh, as a playwright, as an actor, and all this, I love stories. Uh, but a lot of times, with, especially I suppose with, with plays and stuff like that, and, and also with books and, and stories, is that it's what's not said, it's what characters are hiding, what's a mystery about them is what intrigues us as readers or as audiences. Uh, and what I loved about many of the stories in this, we get to know the characters, we spend, uh, we spend time with them, but they all seem to hold something back. There all seems to be something about them, and you're trying to put your finger on it, and Michael doesn't give you any easy answers. You, the reader, have to do some work, bring your imagination to the words on the page as well. I think that's a wonderful thing to have. Uh, so I'm not a passive reader, I'm an active reader. And that's a great uh, testament to Michael's skill that he draws you in, but he also leaves you questions. And there are two stories in particular uh, which, um, uh, which really sort of stayed with me afterwards. Uh, not because of what was said, but more importantly because of what's not said. There's other stuff going on, and he doesn't lay it out for me, he doesn't make it easy for me, it's not all wrapped up in a tiny bowl and saying, this is what's going on, this is how the character feels, this is what's going to happen. But he leaves it running around in your mind, what's going to happen next, how are they feeling? And in one story, a, a, a visitor, there are two characters, uh, as I say, no spoilers, and it's a very simple, fairly ordinary conversation between these two characters. But you are left at the end with a sense of mystery, a sense of, oh, I hope they're going to be okay, because there's something going on underneath. And as I say, he doesn't lay it out for you, so you have to bring your own imagination, your own empathy for the characters to it. And as I say, that story really stood, stuck with me. On face value, it's a very simple story about a very ordinary conversation. But the skill of the writer is to say there's more going on with these people than meets the eye, and that is a, a huge, huge talent, so thank you. And the other one, which is, a, I think, the last story in the book, A Study in F, which is just a single day in an ordinary person's life, and in their work life. It's not their home life, it's not their love life, it's just their work life. Not the best of days, um, and I found this character fascinating, because he starts off one way, and then he goes another way, and then he comes back to one way, and you're, you're constantly trying to figure out where does he live? 
we're in this family life. Why is he like this? But you only get to meet him on that one day. So again, you're left with this, this worry for the character afterwards. What's going to happen next? And again, a story that stays with you, I think, is a story incredibly well written and incredibly well imagined. And a huge compliment to Michael on, on one, he's skillful use of words, but also his huge empathy and understanding of characters, uh, both older, much younger, more female <laughs> than him. The whole range of human life is in this book. Uh, and now let's get to the setting. Look at this fabulous publication. Isn't it gorgeous? Isn't it lovely? You fit in your handbag. It's excellent. And I hate to mention the C word in September, but Christmas will be upon us soon. And this book would make a perfect stocking filler. Absolute perfect stocking filler. Uh, so congratulations to Michael, uh, to the Limerick Writers' Centre, and all involved. This is a class, class publication. Uh, beautifully designed, beautifully presented with marvellous stories, and it's a tribute to all involved, but especially to Michael. So, Michael, congratulations, and uh, they're on sale right here. <laughs> Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. You see, he literally dropped. My pleasure to uh, invite Michael to come up and um, charm us with your words. <laughs> okay, um, thanks very much, uh, Miles, for your very kind words. That was, that was, um, that was very nice to hear. Um, and thanks to Dominic as well, and for everyone at the Limerick Writers Centre for helping me along with publishing this book. Um, it's been a work, maybe a year and a half or so because as like most people um i gotta work so I, I don't actually just sit down all day and get to write books so i gotta do this in my spare time so it takes a while to get stuff done um and so when you eventually do get done every two or three years it's kind of it's kind of a big moment in, in life i suppose and everything kind of comes together and you kind of worry about whether whether it's going to come across the way you want it to come across but um i have to say much more so than with the novel i wrote which i, lo I love the novel i'm very proud of the novel and i it will always be there for me, it's the first thing I ever did. But I do think that this is kind of the strongest thing I ever wrote, and I felt that I've kind of reached a point in terms of, in terms of writing prose where I'm kind of, I've kind of reached a kind of a, not the pinnacle of what I would, but I've kind of reached some, somewhere fairly high in the sense that I think after this, I'm kind of going to take a little bit of a break for a while. I might try and write a play or something like that. But I think kind of my prose writing at this point has kind of reached its kind of natural point, and it's going to be left for a while. So this is kind of where it's going to stay in for a while. So I'm very proud of the of the of the short stories, and um, I hope you enjoy them for anybody that that, that, that takes the time to buy it or to read it. Um, so I decided um, I was given lots of space to read to read some stories tonight, and what I decided I would do is I'd read um, a kind of a longer story first, and then a short story, a very short story. And by longer, I mean something maybe about 12 minutes long, so not very long. <laughs> don't, don't worry, I'm here all night, so <laughs> maybe about 12 minutes long. Then, um, and then I read one that's literally two pages, maybe like three minutes long. That's, that's going to be it, okay? Um, okay, so the story I decided I would read, um, the longer one, is called The Envelope. And The Envelope is about um, a person, I think anybody from Limerick or anybody from, maybe some from anywhere around the country can relate to it. And it's about going to Dublin on a train, basically. <laughs> and what it's like to go to Dublin on a train when you're not used to going to Dublin on a train how you feel you're going to like the, the big city and the big capital and whatever, and the journey that that takes, and how you think about life as you look through the train window, and so on, and all, the things, all those things that we all think about. So it's called The Envelope. The carriage rocked a little while pulling out of Spolberg station, and the black of early winter hastened behind the amber glow of the city's street lamps. <coughs> now slipping into night, the evening spell of soft rain had eased and spooned itself into fine cotton clouds of white mist, teasing the edge of the open platform and melting against the flanks of the moving train. Sliding a grey headphone into the hollow of his left ear, Sammy Edwards allowed the side of his face to press against the glass of the 1820 Limerick to Houston station, while watching each vacant bench of the platform drift by in lonesome servitude. It was always best to leave one year unoccupied, especially on lazy Sunday evenings, so as to avoid missing any important announcements from the friendly digital voice of the female train. 
Indeed, she had just announced that the next stop would be Limerick Junction, and heaven forbid he would miss his change and wake up in an empty train, just as Ireland's lonely railways yawned and closed their weary lines for the night. Having fallen too sleepy for a scroll through his phone, Sammy listened to the weight of the train come along the smooth steel of the tracks and felt its faint tremors caress the fore his forehead against the surface of the glass. Before his eyes, beads of moisture snaked in reflective trails from one edge of the window to the next, distorting twinkling lights from, re from the residential buildings which were becoming ever sparser as his train left the city and began to rush into the full dark heart of the countryside. And what a country, thought Sammy, as he reflected upon his annual trip to the capital. Being the line, the line manager of the, uh, during the expansion of the recycling plant, it had become part of his remit to attend a conference at the company's headquarters at the end of each year. Here, like every other year, he would give a PowerPoint presentation on the plant's performance and highlight various aspects of production which could be tweaked to improve output or lower overall operational costs. Finally, he would attend a team building exercise with other managerial staff where the virtues of trust and loyalty would be championed as the cornerstones of their future personal development. How he loathed it. Bringing his face away from the glass, Sammy softly pressed the rear of his head into the firm cushion of the seat. But a job was a job. Hadn't it guided him through a recession and reared a small family? Many would be glad of it, of course, and providing for his wife and daughters had provided him with a dignity not easily afforded to many less fortunate friends. The female voice announced that his train had arrived on time at Limerick Junction. He would not need to switch trains after all, as his current one would be travelling all the way to Dublin. Had Kate not told him he would stay on the same train when she booked the tickets, he either wasn't listening or couldn't remember. And exhaling lightly through a corner of his lips, he wondered which reality would irritate her less. Accompanying these reflections, the quiet and rural platform of Limerick Junction glowed faintly before the pitch black which was gathered behind it. The humble station seemed a flickering candle in a rolling ocean of night, and several grey figures stood huddled beneath the dim lighting, impatiently stepping from one foot to another as the carriages slowly ground to a halt. Watching their icy forms step hurriedly inside, Sammy felt a queer blend of joy and guilt as they opened the doors to other carriages. He had enjoyed the silent company of his fellow solitary travellers and wished for that tranquil atmosphere to continue beyond his journey's first stop. And so, settling back into the warm embrace of his headrest, Sammy listened to the wheels turn once more as the train snaked slowly away from the old station and back to the envelope of the night. The remainder of his journey might take the bones of an hour and a half, he mused, before grumbling at the sound of the carriage door rattling open behind him. Someone had arrived to disturb his peace after all. Heavy footsteps accompanied the squeaking wheels of a well-travelled suitcase along the carpet before pausing behind his ear. The momentary silence was uncomfortable and broken by the startling announcement of his name. Sam Edwards, by God, it's yourself, is it? Boomed the voice of some debt and authority. Opening his eyes with a jolt, Sammy quickly turned his head towards the sound. Here, towering above him, Frank Malloy smiled warmly through the bristles of his thick black beard. Long time no see, Sammo. Mind if I join you? This was indeed a surprise. Sammy had rarely seen his classmate since they left school almost 20 years ago. Managing a weak, reciprocal smile, Sammy watched as Malloy shoved his case loudly into the overhead storage rail and unfastened the buttons of his heavy winter coat. While folding the coat neatly beside his case, a sharp aroma of aftershave began to waft notably from under his sleeves of the man's sweater and rained in pungent plumes around the seating area and a small number of occupants below. Once this task was completed to his satisfaction, Malloy tucked in his shirt tails, fixed the seams of his sweater and brought his considerable bulk to rest behind the table, separating himself and his old acquaintance. Finally he spoke, and when he did, Sammy noticed. He did so with the mild lilt of a Dublin accent. Jesus Christ, Samo, what's it been now? Ten years of a day. Oh, at least that, Frank. And you're looking fresh too, fair play to you. 
that grey Limerick air mustn't be as poisonous as they make out, what? <laughs> That's true enough to be sure, Sandy replied quietly. Maybe when you're born there you build something of an immunity to it. Not so sure about that now, Sandboy. When I, wasn't I born with an ass's roar of yourself? And I would, couldn't wait to sit my arse on this train many years ago. One way. You're living in Dublin all the time since. Indeed and I am. Malahide for the most part. It was a tough old station for a few years, but I kept the head down and I persevered. Good stuff, kid. Well, hard work is never easy, as the man says. But after a spell of misfortune, I scored myself a cushy number as a field rep for a small hotel chain. If you put in the hours, they look after you well. You know? He knew. Sammy gazed at the sparkle from the reflective face of his old friend's watch. It's just after seven, Frank smiled contentedly. But tell us anyway, what are you doing with yourself at all these days? I'm still at the recycling plant out on the Valley Simon Road. I'm a line manager now. Upon hearing this news, Malloy sat forward in his seat and crossed his large forearms on the tabletop. Keeping his dark eyes fixed upon Sammy, he knitted the lines of his brow and spoke in a peculiarly hushed tone that seemed befitting of a manner of some importance. Well, I'll tell you something, but you're a more patient man than myself. By God, I've been climbing the walls and frotting at the mouth if I was there for a spell of ten years now. Coming up on twelve now, Frank. Really? The big man exclaimed. You know what that is? Loyalty and perseverance to your station. It's not a thing found, in, found once in a Limerick man, and I respect that, so I do. Sammy looked quizzically at the assured countenance of his old friend before allowing, allowing his gaze to drift to the darkness outside and the reflection of his own tired eyes upon the glass. I suppose you could call it loyalty, but it's to Kate and to two girls, really. This unexpected development brought about a sudden change in Malloy. Two girls, you say, he replied loudly before reaching across the table to clap a heavy hand on the smaller man's shoulder. Well, fair play to you, Sammy, old boy. I didn't think you had the stones. <laughs> and what are their names? Ashley and Siobhan. Ha! Malloy parade, bringing his pen down forcefully upon the tabletop. That's your country now. Two fine Irish names. What? They are, I suppose. Kate picked them out before I gave the green light. <laughs> well, this Kate sounds like a fine woman, if you don't mind my saying. And the two girls are healthy. They are? Oh, devil of fear of him. Open the car opening the cavern of his mouth for another bold statement, Malai paused mid-breath as the door in the rear of the carriage slid open and a dark-skinned young woman entered behind a refreshments trolley. Keeping his mouth fixed ajar, Malai raised his large arm and began to twirl his index finger in quick circles. You'll have a drink, he asked of Sammy. Maybe a coffee if you're having one yourself. The lady arrived at her table and at Malai's request, promptly placed two disposable cups upon white napkins in front of the men. Handing her a five euro note, for which he requested no change, Malai grinned suggestively at the young woman. May the rails rise to meet you, my fair Colleen. <laughs> Smiling politely, the woman paused her rattling trolley to the next, or passed her rattling trolley to the next table, while Malloy's eyes trailed her momentarily before returning to his companion with a wink. A gamey bird if ever I spotted one, he declared beneath his breath. Now, young Edwards, we'll toast to the prosperity of these two new additions to the Edwards clan, and of course, let it always be said, to the health and well-being of their darling Mott. <laughs> Holding his coffee cup in a mild salute, Sammy nodded his appreciation. You're a gentleman, Frank. Stall the ball now, Sammy boy, Malloy returned with an outstretched pan. We're not quite ready for a toast of this magnitude just yet, so we're not. Placing his pans upon the table, he lifted his weight slowly out of the seat and into the centre of the aisle, where he began to rummage through the front compartment of his suitcase. Be with you in a tick now, Sandboy, he called from above his companion's head, before finally zipping fast his case and awkwardly bringing his large body back behind the table once more. Grinning mischievously, Malloy dropped the base of a half bottle of Powers whiskey loudly on the tabletop. No harm in making it a bit Irish, what? And no, Frank, I have an early start in the morning. Air would you give over that silly talk, man? I haven't seen sight nor hair of you for near ten years. And then you come to me with news of a steady and noble mot and a pair of healthy sprogs toddling behind her. I really shouldn't, Frank. I have to find the hotel in Dublin and all yet. Sure, we'll be there in half an hour. You'll have an hour drop. Pressing the rear of his head against the soft seat, 
Sammy gazed at the raindrops and felt an oddness in the corner of his mouth as they began to smile reluctantly. Go on, so. I'll have the one. Jesus, Frank, you never lost a kid. <laughs> That's your country, barked Malloy jovially, unscrewing the lid of the glass bottle and generously splashing the whiskey into, into Sammy's coffee cup. Give that a good stir now and let it warm the cockles of your heart before you arrive in the old pail. After filling his own cup to the rim, Malloy quickly stirred the liquid with a plastic spoon and raised his toast once more. To the wife and kids, Samuel. Thanks, Frank. And to old friends. And to old Limerick, Malloy added with a cackle. May she ever remain the innocent lady of the Midwest. Drinking deep, both men brought their cups back to the table, and Sammy noticed the sparkle in his friend's eyes as they reveled at the contortion of his face. Two Irish for you. Is that the crack? Malloy jeered. You need to get out of stabbers and taste a little of what the good world has, to, has on the menu. <laughs> because once you've drunk black rum on a Jamaican beach, you can get back to me so you can. None of this piss water that sells a dry saps around here, mind. I'm talking real Jamaican black now. So you've been to the Caribbean? Sammy inquired, feeling the spark of whiskey flickering to a flame and warm in the cave of his belly. The Caribbean? I've toured all over the Americas and gave a spell down under too for my sins. Was that with the rugby crowd? The rugby crowd. Not at all, young Samuel. So you went to your own village and so. Malloy tilted his head inwards and rested it upon his large neck while considering his companion suspiciously. Yes, I went to my own volition, as you highfalutin shadow ciders might put it. <laughs> I'd love to see Sydney Harbour myself someday, Sammy mused, looking out the window to the black void. Well, I'll tell you something for nothing now, Malloy spoke in a hushed tone once more leaning over the table, as if to relay a guarded secret. They look after you very well in this hotel, Rep Geek, if you know how to play the game. Sure, I guess penthouse rooms all around the globe for business trips a few times a year, and not one shilling does it cost me neither. Sammy felt his jaw slacken as he looked at his friend in some disbelief. Really? Chalk it down, old son, the lie grinned, settling back into his seat with an air of satisfaction while watching his companion's eyes stare through the window to the dark. Pausing for a moment, Sammy then listened as his friend's words came to him, slowly and deliberately. There's a lot of deep pockets in that world out there, Sammy boy. You just have to know which ones to have your hand into. Over the home of steel along the tracks, a long silence then broke out between the pair, crackling like the end of a powerful record, leaving its listeners to consider the significance of what they had heard. Discounts around the globe are what Malloy had fallen in for, and Sammy found himself swallowing his sigh deep within his chest, so as not to embolden the smirk on his old friend's lips. For all Malloy's bluster, he had nonetheless taken the world for what, it had, for what it had and forged the life he wore with his own hands. He had earned the freedom which he used to traverse the earth, and the attitude that brought him to the top of the tree was the same attitude which allowed him to enjoy its fruits. He was settled for nothing, else, nothing less. The void had turned to an orange as the lights of the capital began streaming past the window, and Sammy felt the train slow and shudder beneath his feet. A voice announced their imminent arrival in Dublin, Houston, and the shuffle of passengers began in earnest as the carriage sparked into life from his intercity coma. Well, enjoy your short stay with us up here, and don't be a stranger, Malloy wheezed as he stretched his arms above his head. I'm sure the lovely Kate allows you the odd point when you're away on business. I'll be fairly flat out, flat out over the next few days, but we'll see, Sammy replied, forcing his lips to paint a breezy smile. Well, you'll find me online, and I'll be sure to fix you up on a cheap room for your annual trip next year, Malloy grunted, while taking down his case and briskly uh, throwing his coat about his shoulders. Now, I've got, a, I've got a friend parked in a taxi rank, so I better dash. Holding out his large, smooth palm, he waited for Sammy's hand to wrap round it before giving it a firm squeeze. You're a gentleman as always, Mr. Edwards, he growled. The country couldn't stay afloat without the likes of you. <laughs> Turning sharply on his heel, the large man then hurried his bulk between the seats along the aisle, leaving a bustling wake of heavy breaths and mixed aftershave spices. Stepping off the train moments later, Sammy gazed along the lengthy, plat the lengthy dark platform. Figures walked in solitude upon the sheen of the icy flags, silent but for the sniffles in their nostrils and the echoes of their shoes. The Dublin beyond them heaved with quiet possibilities, a looming mass of concrete and unrealised experiences, 
Seductive, it waited patiently in the gloom, as a playground for Malloy and his friends. For Sammy, such liberation would never occur again, and he wondered wickedly if it ever had. He was too young when he had gotten married. He was too young, and now his phone was dead. His phone was dead. Realising that his phone was out of battery, and that he'd forgotten what hotel he was staying in, Sammy began to panic on his next decision. Where was that hotel? Could be anywhere. He could ask someone. No, they couldn't know. Why didn't he charge his phone? There was a socket on the train. It was no use. As he looked back towards home, Sammy, realized, Sammy released a slow sigh and watched a trail of his mist dissipate to nothing in the cool Dublin air. Walking towards the darkness at the end of the platform, he felt alone at the edge of the world. A faint sprinkle of snow had begun to fall upon the railway, and as he gazed at the flakes lodging softly along the tracks, he wandered on their vast distance. The cold steel stretched from his eyes through the dark interior of his country and back through the heart of Limerick. Reaching into a pocket of his jacket for warmth, Sammy felt his fingers touch a folded sheet of paper, and removing it with stiffening fingers, he held it beneath the lamp, the lamp light for inspection. The paper had a hotel name written in it, in Kate's familiar calligraphic writing. His heart swooned. Carton Hotel, Blanchardstown. It was those three little words. Okay, that was a little bit longer than I thought it was, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Is that really um, yeah, so that was just uh, so a, a, a journey to Dublin. I, was, I suppose that, that, that feeling that we all have of what if, I suppose, that, was, that never really leaves us. So um, I'm going to read one more story before we leave tonight, and it's a short one this time. So it should only be maybe maybe about three minutes long, I'd say. Um, it's the last story in the, in the collection, um, and it's called Someone I Loved in Ireland. And it's based on the idea, I suppose, again, I suppose it's, it's kind of similar. It's based on the, on, on the idea of what we've missed out on in life. Because it doesn't matter what you are, it doesn't matter when you're a child, you always have ten ideas in your head about what you want to be. I want to be an astronaut, I want to be a teacher, maybe, I want to be a fireman, I want to be a policeman. But you can't be all of these things, you can only be one. And whatever it is that you pick, and even if you don't pick any of them, you're going to regret the things that you didn't do. Of course you are, and you'll never get to experience them. And so the last, um, and of course that, that of course also applies to love and to people that you meet along the way, and you wonder, if I stayed with that person, would life have worked out this way and that way? And it's, it's an endless maze. You never know, of course. But you always, you always can't help but to think what would have been. It, it's, it's not so much as a fork in the road. There's like a, a place in Paris where there's like 40 roads going in every direction. <laughs> you, know, you could have picked any one of them. Okay, so we're thinking about all of these things. So it's a little bit like that. But anyway, it's quite short. Um, and it's called. It's the last. It's actually the last um, story in the book. And it's called Someone I Loved in Ireland. We walked about the city in circles once, you and I. Warm footpaths and younger feet. Your toenails were painted a sparkling pink and illuminated the grey footpaths wherever they stood. And when each breeze flowed through your summer dress, I watched the trail behind your slender form and linger in the loose brown strands of your hair. You would always hold just one of my fingers, hinting that our time together was transient. Neither our hearts nor our fingers could ever truly interlock. Our moments were gloriously finite and embellished with the glow of an imminent end. Where there can be no future, the present must live. I think you told me that. We strolled that way along the quays and under the shade of Sarsfield Bridge, not knowing where our feet were carrying us, as if discovering the city for the first time together. We wandered through Arthur's Key Park and watched our shadows spill over the railings and into the river. A ripple rolled against the moss-speckled foundations of King John's castle, while our eyes ascended the turret to a red flag fluttering against the boundless blue skies. The kingdom of monsters crim crimson sand standard, you assured me with surprising pride before warmly kissing my lips. I often looked upon that moment in the years that passed. While turning a pen in my fingers, I would bring the wetness of your lips to my mind. The liberty wrought in the impulsive sparks of youth seemed a million miles from my desk in Croydon, paper strewn, 
exams uncorrected, red pens and unruly students, constricting ties. Yet I was glad of the moment, thankful for the pleasant space it occupied in my mind. I could return and decorate it with my senses whenever the need arose. And as I festooned my happy place with red flags and pink sparkles, it would occur to me that most people had a room of their own, somewhere to return to. Now I have returned to you, back across the waves and touching down in the Shannon marshes. You told me once that the dual carriageway from the airport to the city was the first of its kind in Ireland, that the Americans built it. Transatlantic travel rooted in the region since the flying boats landed in Foynes. Frigid passengers, Irish coffee, warm hearts, cold hands. As I touch them now in your last repose, rosary beads wrapped dutifully around your white fingers, icy passengers on this final journey. Silence, a sunken face still framed in beauty, peace written softly across each feature. I imagine the luster of your eyes behind closed lids, the powdered corners of a mischievous smile. A wedding band marks a union, one more broken heart. My hand met his firm grip as I walked through the door. A kind soul. I want to believe he's a good man. To believe it for you. How I wish to wake up in yesterday. How we rolled on the grass under the iron bridge in college. Looking down at my face, you notice I had become distant. Lost beyond the moment. Where have you gone? You ask me. I can't remember where. Yet when I gazed upward to your glistening face in the sunlight, a bead of moisture rolling to the tip of your nose, I knew this world had been created just for us, for these moments. Recalling that moment, I can see the same bead of moisture, but my memories fragment above your head in white clouds of cotton wool. In vain, I reach out so I may spool them to something more permanent. In vain. The memory of your kiss. In vain. Your face now fractured, your hair in silver bands. Your words. Where have you gone? Everybody that's come along to support us tonight uh, means a lot. And books uh, are on sale for how much time? 12 euro, 12 euro, so 12 euro. And you can so. sign them as well. <laughs> and, yes, I can sign them for an extra 2 euro. Okay. okay, thanks very much, guys. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, everyone. Looking back when times were tough I was alone I could never seem to get enough To keep me gone I spent my days just running through the lanes I couldn't stop running cause I was running away Remember my Uncle Pa He was my friend He taught me how to drink the pine Three sheets in the wind Other nights we laughed and drank Till the break of dawn As the Shannon echoed the birth Of a brand new morn the rain 
rain. 